But it's such a joy to be here. My wife, Barbie, is here as well. She uh, insists on coming with me when I come to Bahrain. And that's uh, largely because of this church. And of course, friends that we've made uh, on our visits. And the women's Bible study on Tuesday morning, she talks about this in, in Arizona where we live every time she gets a, a chance to speak about it. And uh, this church, I want you to know, I mean, look around at each other. This church is a narthex to heaven. People meet God here. And we know when we come, we're going to meet God here. So God has blessed you. God will bless you this morning uh, as long as the Spirit <laughs> blesses me in this message. Uh, it is great to be here. And um, as uh, Pastor Jim mentioned, uh, he and I have known each other for uh, many years, uh, both in ministry and a little bit in my work in psychology. And referring to that, when I uh, went into uh, my studies in psychology, I was particularly interested in what we call human personality. I'm interested in how the personality is shaped. I'm interested in how the personality functions. So that was my major focus when I was in school. Uh, this will not be entirely new to you uh, because most of you have had some kind of course in psychology. How many of you have heard of Sigmund Freud? Okay, that's pretty widespread. What about one of his early followers, Carl Jung? Oh yeah, a lot of hands for that too. Anybody heard of uh, Fred Skinner, B.F. Skinner? Oh yeah, sure, yeah, behaviorism's gotten around. And, and the great uh, Russian psychologist gave us classical conditioning, Ivan Pavlov. Oh yeah, that's, Pavlov's been heard of too, okay. So you have some familiarity already with my field. Uh, now I should warn you a little bit, or maybe give you a little preview about uh, how to listen to this message. Because the first part of this message is going to sound like a psychology lecture. It's really part of a sermon, but that won't be obvious until we get to the second part, which is about Jesus calling Nathaniel, about which uh, Pastor Jim just read. And once we've put those together, then we get to talk about what it means to be authentically a Christian. Okay? So, first what will sound like psychology. Uh, of course, when you major in a topic, you get to look at not only the major figures like Freud and Jung and Skinner and Pavlov. You get to look at some lesser known uh, people who studied psychology and offer us some other perspectives. One of whom was a man by the name of Irving Goffman. Irving Goffman, and Irving Goffman, I think, was in some way inspired by the great British playwright William Shakespeare. Shakespeare has one of his characters say in a play, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and in their lifetimes, play many parts. Well, Irving Goffman took that as an inspiration and began to analyze human behavior in terms of the stage, in terms of the theater. Many of you have been to the theater, seen live stage plays, whether uh, in, in a commercial theater or perhaps the children here in church put on a skit or a play. And so you know that in a theater, there's an area called the front stage. And then behind the front stage, there's something like a curtain or maybe a set or something. It looks like a town. It looks like a warehouse. It looks like a railroad track, something like that. And then there's backstage that the audience can't see. And the actors and the actresses come out on stage and they play their roles. But then sometimes they're off stage and their behavior backstage is different from their behavior on the front stage. Because on the front stage, they're playing to us. <clears throat> backstage, they're saying, do you have a safety pin so I can hold this part of my gown up? Is my wig on straight? I hope I remember my lines for this next scene. Oh, okay. So the behavior is really quite in contrast. Now Goffman says, 
let's think about the lives we live and how we have our front stage and our backstage behavior. Let's just say you go to a restaurant. And the waiter comes out, poised, smiles, going to get you some water. What would you like to order? Is the hot food hot? Is this tasty? What do you think about the presentation and all? And maybe that same waiter, in a moment, goes back through the swinging door into the kitchen. And he's got a raging argument going with the chef. And they're all heated against each other. And then comes back out. Would you like some dessert? Yeah. Yeah, you've been there. So, Goffman says, there's this front stage behavior, and there's the backstage. Now, we do this. Uh, suppose you have a job interview. You wear your best clothes. You're on your best manners. Your language is clean and polite. You're going to make a good impression. And that's important for us. Okay? And um, we hope that when you, when you go home and talk with your family, and your family says, how did it go? that you're the same polite, kind, courteous person. You may not have the suit and tie or whatever it is, but you know we understand that we do play roles. But we do expect our behavior in public and in private to re reflect the same character. Not always true. Not always true. Because, well, I'll give you a story. Part of my work as a psychologist in Phoenix, Arizona, in the States, involves working in a couple of hospitals. And there is a, um, to my perception, a wonderful nurse, her name is Anna. Uh, and three years ago, when I had a pacemaker implanted here to make sure my heart <clears throat> doesn't just go wild, uh, Anna, <clears throat> Anna was also going through some cardiac stuff, and she seemed to take a special interest in me. And she always greets me warmly. Oh, doctor, so good to see you. You're my favorite doctor. What are, you know, how can I help you? you know? But then I learned later from some other nurses that they don't really trust Anna. They call her two-faced, meaning she shows one face to me and maybe other doctors, I don't know, and then the other face to them. So they don't trust who she is. Or there was a time, Pastor Jim mentioned, I was editor of the Church Herald. Okay, so uh, I did that for 17 years. And at one point, I hired an associate editor. Uh, I had a couple of associate editors, and I'll just call this one Sharon. And when I uh, interviewed Sharon, she was poised. She was well-dressed. She was polite. She had good skills. She had a good resume. Uh, and she was a good associate editor. In fact, uh, when I had to leave town, which I often did because that was a travel job as well, I said, Sharon's in charge. She's the editor in my absence. But over a period of a few months, I learned that nobody in the office liked Sharon. They all disliked her. So I started to inquire a little bit. And it turns out Sharon was a different person when I was there from the person she was when I wasn't there. She had her front stage behavior when I was present, and she had her backstage behavior when I wasn't. For Sharon, I was audience, <laughs> and she was front stage when I was there. But when I wasn't there, even though it was the same building in the same room, that was backstage to her. And she treated my other employees poorly. And she lasted four or five months. And there's a sense in which I was sad to see her go because of her skills. But she had to go because she made it miserable for everybody else and I couldn't trust what was happening when I was away. Now we learn more about a person from her or his backstage behavior than from the front stage, okay? 
Because when a person comes for an interview, anybody can look good for an hour. And most of us can look good on paper too, okay? But if you have some windows into the backstage behavior, then you learn whether the character is consistent and what the real person is like. Okay, now we'll move from psychology to Nathaniel. As Pastor Jim read, uh, this was, I should give you a little context about that passage, because we dropped into the middle of, of a story, really. This is uh, John chapter 1, so you know it's near the beginning of the story about Jesus' ministry, right? And, and we've had that wonderful opening uh, chapter, the Gospel of John, uh, about the Word, and God became flesh, and so on. Now Jesus is, later in this chapter, selecting his disciples. He's going to pick 12 people, 12 men, to follow him closely. And he's already selected three or four, it's not clear how many, but he selected Philip among the first. They sleep the night. The scripture says on the next day, he decided to go to the Galilee. The Galilee was not the posh, fancy, nice-looking part of, the, of, 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 the, of Israel, the part that you didn't so much want to go to. But as they're walking, uh, Philip sees a friend of his called Nathaniel. He says, Nathaniel, this is the Messiah. This is the one our prophets told us about. He's from Galilee, son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says, really? I mean, this is is John's paraphrase, okay? This is not literal, okay? But does anything good ever come out of Galilee? So he's kind of the skeptic at that point. And Philip says, well, come and see. At which point... Jesus looks Nathanael in the eye and he says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now that's a compliment. The Greek word for deceit is dolos. It means treachery, trickery, deceitfulness, trying to trick people. And he says, Here's a man, there is no deceit. So this is like Jesus seeing Nathaniel and looking at the backstage Nathaniel, right? Because <laughs> he knows what Nathaniel's behavior is, even when Nathaniel's not in public. Nathaniel says, how do you know me? Frankly, I think Jesus appreciated the skepticism. I think Jesus liked that. And Jesus says, well... I saw you sitting under the fig tree back earlier in our walk. Okay, so now it dawns on Nathaniel. This really is the Lord. And he follows him. Single encounter, Nathaniel says, I'm on board. A couple sidebar things about Nathaniel for those of you who are, are curious about this. If you're reading this in a book or seeing it on your um, screen of your computer, this would be kind of a sidebar. Uh, and, and one sidebar is this. The name Nathaniel is mentioned only in the Gospel of John. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't find Nathaniel. What you find is the name Bartholomew. Now, all of the Gospels agree there were 12 who followed Jesus. And the other 11 are all the same 11 names in all four Gospels. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't read the name Nathaniel. We read the name Bartholomew. Almost certainly the same person went by two different names. You know people who do that. They go by their middle name or they go by whatever. Uh, So that's just one little little fact about that. Um, Another thing is that Nathaniel isn't mentioned very much, even in the Gospel of John. He's mentioned here at the beginning. And the only other mention of Nathaniel is at the end of the book, after the resurrection, and Jesus' disciples have figured that they might as well go back to fishing. (laughs) So they went fishing, they went fishing all night, they caught nothing. And then Jesus comes, remember the story, he says, well, go back out and cast your nets on the other side. Remember the story? And they come up with this whole huge break-the-nets load of fish. 
Okay, Nathaniel's mentioned there. And not for doing anything, just being just for being a witness. Just for, for seeing it. Now it seems to me that Jesus actually picked Nathaniel before Philip introduced them. Jesus could have just pulled Nathaniel in on his own behalf. He already knew who Nathaniel was. Okay? But he was re- waiting to use human uh, provisions. He was willing to use Philip to make the introduction. You know, God does that a lot. God might sometime break into your life or somebody else's life and just go, bam, gotcha. But most of the time, God is using humans to accomplish God's mission. And so Jesus had some reason for wanting to use Philip to do this. And Philip was naive to it, and Nathaniel was naive to it, but Jesus already knew. So, just be aware. You never know when God is going to be using you. God might have something in mind that you haven't seen yet. You might just be a bystander to witness, but you're there to witness to what you've seen here. Okay? So that's Nathaniel. Now about authentic living. Authentic living means that the front stage behavior of a person and the backstage behavior of that same person are consistent. That's what authenticity means. What you see is what you get. A person who treats you all kindly is not bad-mouthing you behind your back, as we say, behind stage. Okay, there's that consistency there. And we all kind of have to work at that. Because there's always this temptation uh, to behave in a different way when we're in a different setting, to please somebody else or to handle some of our own distress or whatever it is. So we need to be attentive and we need to be aware and we need to, to work at making the front stage and the backstage behavior consistent with each other. I think part of that involves treating everyone alike. You treat the boy with the mop, the sweeper in the food court in the mall, uh, the same as you would treat the vice president of a company or your boss. In God's eyes, everyone is equally God's servant, and you might be speaking to a prince or a princess in God's eyes. You also use clean language. Most of you know people who uh, use polite language when they have to be careful about that. But when they tell a joke, it gets a little shady. And so you detect that this person gets humor out of shady kind of uh, edgy kinds of humor. I had a patient some years ago. I'll call him Ralph. And Ralph came to me because his marriage was in trouble. A certain amount of my practice has to do with relationship things, marriages and things like that. So I'm talking with Ralph, and I'm getting a little history as to how the marriage started and what kind of seemed to go wrong in the past. Uh, and, uh, and here's what I heard. I heard that Ralph had a job that he was sometimes in the office, but sometimes he could work from home in his home office. He would still have to call in, and there were other employees in this company who also could work on ho- uh, at home or on the road, so they didn't all have to be in the office at their desk in order to get the job done. And there was a particular woman at Ralph's company um, uh, who was uh, apparently attractive to him and had a similar sense of humor, So when they would be on the phone to each other, not in the office, they'd handle their business and then he would ask something like, what are you wearing? Oh, I hoped it was that short skirt that I've sometimes seen you in. 
Well, really, you're not all completely dressed. And so the front stage part of the conversation, which was the business, got to be backstage conversation that had sexual overtones. Not consistent. Is there any trouble that Ralph's marriage got into, <laughs> any surprise that Ralph's marriage got into difficulty? No, we know where that path leads. And, and we learn about Ralph's true character when we learn about the backstage behavior, about the parts of the conversation that he really would want and didn't want known in public. There was a time, I'm old enough, I've done a lot of things. There was a time, first, my first real job out of school uh, was a teaching job. I taught psychology at a college in Orange City, Iowa, in the States, called Northwestern College. It's one of the colleges of the Reformed Church in America. And uh, as soon as I got on the campus, I met one of the very nice people on that campus, uh, whose name was Art Hilkema. Art, uh, Mr. Hilkema, was our librarian. And when I came to the campus, within the first couple of weeks, he invited me over to the library. And he said, John, I would like to buy books that you would like to have in the library for your psychology students. What books would you like me to buy? <laughs> for a professor, there's no more wonderful thing. May I buy books for you? So I'm talking there with Mr. Hill. Come on, I noticed a little sign on his desk. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. And I thought, wonderful. He knows. He slips. I guess that applies to me too. We know that the people we meet are not yet the people God is bringing them uh, to become. And sometimes we're painfully aware that we're not the person that God wants us to be either. So the message this morning is become more consistent. Match your backstage behavior to the standards you have on the front stage. Be an authentic person as God is making you to be. Amen.